So let's go to hacker rank. How about that? Welcome to the Haskell rank, the series where we solve programming problems. But, you know, in Haskell. Between two sets. Here we go. The description is extremely simple, but maybe in some sense it's difficult to understand. You will be given two arrays of integers. You will be asked to determine all integers that satisfy the following two conditions. The elements of the first array are all factors of the integer being considered. The integer being considered is a factor of all elements of the second array. These numbers are referred to as being between the two arrays. You must determine how many such numbers exist. Let's try to think what elements satisfy the first condition. Elements of the first array are supposed to be the factors of the considered integer. That means that integer, let's call that integer t, because I drink tea all the time. So that integer is actually equal to least common multiplier of all of the numbers of the first array times some number k, which is greater or equal to 1. The least common multiplier is the smallest number that can be divided by all of those numbers. All of those numbers can divide t. And by that, we satisfy the first condition. So as you can see, by that definition, the amount of t's is actually infinite, because k is not limited by anything above. It's only limited from, from the bottom. This is the first condition. Let's see what numbers satisfy the second condition. The second condition is that the integer being considered is a factor of all elements of the second array. But that particular t should not be greater than the greatest common divisor of all of the elements of the second array. It should not be greater than that particular number. But to be a divisor of all of the numbers from the second array, t should not be just less than gcd of all of them. It should be actually a divisor of the gcd itself. And this is, by the way, the most important condition. It actually implies that if t divides gcd of the second array, that means it divides all of the numbers of that array. For, for some reason, that was not really obvious for me when I started to look into that problem. Maybe because I'm not that good at arithmetics and stuff like that, because I'm stupid. But if you think about that, that actually makes sense. Uh, because what is any number from the secondary? Let's actually denote it as bi. What is that number? It's some kind of number which is a factor of that number multiplied by gcd of all of the numbers of the secondary. So if you have a number that divides gcd, you actually divide the number itself. And by that, you can divide any number from that array. Basically, to solve that problem, we have to calculate LCM of the numbers of the first array, iterate through the k until t is less than gcd of the second array, and constantly check that that t divides gcd of the second array, and just count how many numbers that satisfy that condition you encounter. All right, the time has come to solve the problem. Let's find out the input format. First line is two numbers, the size of the first array and the size of the second array. The second line is the numbers from the first array and the third line is the numbers from the second array. That's pretty much it. I'm constantly criticized that in this series I don't use do notation and not read the input data imperatively. <sighs> I mean, this language is all about declarative programming, why everybody wants to do imperative stuff in it, but okay, this time we're gonna parse the data in an imperative way, all right, but only once, just to show you that I know how to do that, because apparently people don't believe me. To simplify things, I want to have a function that reads a single line from standard input and parses it into a list of numbers, because as you can see, we have three lines, and each line is just a list of numbers, so I just want to have a, like, imperative function that does exactly that. So let's call this function read int list, I guess. I guess it takes nothing and is supposed to produce a side effect. This is how we denote side effects in Haskell. And that side effect also returns a list of integers. Now I'm going to show you the hard truth that I've been hiding from you for three episodes or even more. Uh, I don't really know when this particular episode comes out. You can actually program in Haskell like in Python. I'm really sorry that I didn't tell you that before. So basically, you want to read a line. You have a function get line. 
and you bind the result of this uh, function to a variable and then you separate words from that line you convert them to numbers and you return them that's it you don't really have to change your mindset and start to think declaratively you can still think imperatively in Haskell and this is something most of the Haskell programmers will try to hide from you they will try to hide that Haskell is actually easy and if you're a Python programmer you can easily program in that language the advantage of Python in that case is that this language at least statically typed so we have a helper function let's try to parse the input with this function we're gonna keep programming in Python first we have to read the sizes of the arrays we read int list and we bind and destructurize it to the corresponding variables then we read the first array and the second array we have everything in place the only thing remains is to implement a function that takes two list of numbers and returns a number basically it takes the first array second array and returns amount of numbers that satisfy these two weird conditions this function is not implemented yet and we have to invoke solve for a's and for b's then we want to convert the result to a string and just print it back on the standard output you see it's that simple it's so easy to understand and so easy to read for imperative programmers so yeah if you have an experience in python java c++ you can program in haskell without even changing your mindset just program as you would program in c++ it's that simple now what we need? We need to calculate the least common multiplier of the first array. In Haskell, we have a function specifically for that. It's called LCM. It takes two numbers and returns the least common multiplier for them. But the problem is we have not two numbers. We have huge amount of them. So what we have to do, imagine that we have a list of several numbers and we have the LCM function. How would you calculate LCM for all of them? I would calculate LCM for A1, A2, then LCM lcm for this value and a3 and then lcm for this value and a4 so calculating like that is not really scalable to any amount of numbers but you can see a pattern you can describe this particular pattern recursively so let's create a function called fold this function will take another function from two values of the same type to a value of the same type basically function of two arguments into one argument this function sort of collapses two values together like LCM you see the type of the LCM is exactly that but you can actually have other functions with the same kind of signature for example plus plus also has a similar signature then this function takes a list and returns a single value and what this function should do it should fold all of the numbers in this particular fashion that we described before let's actually save this uh, that expression for future references so how will we implement that function we have a couple of special cases for example when the list is empty when the list is empty that particular procedure doesn't really make any sense so in that case we can just report an error saying that list is empty next case is when we have a single value in the list in that case we don't have to collapse anything and we can just return that value and the last general case is when we have two or more values in that case we pattern match extracting the head and the list we apply f to x and the recursive call to the tail of the list and let's try to test that function for example one two three four what it will return it will return 12 you can divide 12 by one you can divide 12 by two you can divide 12 by three and you can divide it by four and this is the smallest number that can be divided by all of these numbers so i think it does make sense we can also test that with plus operator and yeah it works it's actually 10 it's supposed to be 10 and let's try to calculate the lcm of a's Fold LCM is. Now, the next thing, we have to calculate the GCD of the second array. We're gonna do that using absolutely the same function. So, in Haskell, we have a range syntax. It's actually a pretty interesting syntax. Instead of typing one, two, three, four, you can type one dot dot four, and that will generate you the list from one to four. And you can provide any boundaries for the range, for example, 100. But what's interesting is that you can provide no upper boundary. That means you will generate a list from one to infinity. So it's gonna be an infinite list. What's the point of such list? Haskell is a lazy language. That means this 
this entire list will be not evaluated until it's needed. So I can even save that list to a variable. And that variable right now contains an infinite list. But it's really dangerous to actually type enter right now. Because once I type enter, Haskell will think that I need that list and it will start evaluating that list and will print from one to infinity until it consumes all of my memory, probably. I don't really know exactly. Will it actually consume all of my memory? Maybe, maybe it will. And what's interesting is that if you take five elements of that list, it will actually return five elements and throw out everything else. Because since you don't use anything after the fifth element, it will not evaluate anything after the fifth element. So that's why you can do that. So this is the power of laziness. It's really difficult to wrap your head around that. But over time, with practice, you start to feel the laziness of the language and you, can, and you start using it to your own advantage. And it's particularly useful when you want to iterate from one to infinity, as in our case, because T actually LCM multiplied by K, where K is greater than one, which goes to infinity. We are going to generate a list from one to infinity and multiply each element of that list by LCM of A's, LCM of the elements of the first array. That generates an infinite list of multiples of LCM of A's. Now we have to iterate those values until they less than GCD of the secondary. To do that, in Haskell we have a function called take while. This particular function takes a predicate, as you can see, a list and returns another list. And what it does, it applies predicates to each element of the list and takes those elements until the predicate is true. Once the predicate becomes false, it junks everything else. For example, you have a list from 1 to 10 and you want to take while the element of that list is less than and five. So yeah, it takes all of the elements until the elements become greater or equal to five. And we're gonna use that particular function to take all of the elements less than GCD of B's. At this point, we have all of the multiples of LCM of the first array that are less or equal, I'm sorry, I made a typo, than GCDs of the second array. And what we have to do, we have to filter out everything that is not a multiple of GCDs of the second array. For that, of course, we're gonna use function called filter. We already know that function, no need to explain what it is. So how to check that a value is a divisor of something. You just mod it and compare it to zero. And at this point, we have a list of the numbers that satisfy both of the conditions. And we are asked to print out their amount. For that, we're going to use length function. So let's format it a little bit so it's a little bit more re uh, readable. That should be pretty much it. We iterate through all of the multiples of LCM. We take only those that are less or equal to B's GCDs and filter out everything that is not a divisor of B's GCD. And then we just calculate the length of it. That should be the solution. It compiles on my machine. Let's see if it compiles on theirs. It does. And let's submit that. Easy. Peasy. And by the way, you don't really have to implement that fold yourself. We have that in the standard library. It's called fold L1. It's called fold L because it performs the left fold. You see, you can actually fold elements of the list from the left and you can fold them from the right. Here is the left fold. How can you fold elements from the right? Imagine that you have our list. You will start from the right side. Apply an F to A3 and A4. Then apply an F to A2 and the previous expression and then apply an F to A1 and the previous expression. So this one is going to be right fold. So L indicates that is it's a left fold and 1 indicates that it has no default value. Uh, what is the default value? For example, function fold L actually takes an extra element. For example, this element will be returned when the list is empty. Fold L does not generate an error on empty list because it always has base value. So that's why it's called fold L1. And we can actually go ahead and remove our implementation, replace it with fold L1 and it's still gonna pass the tests.